Welcome to a beautiful day here in the Philippines. And I want to talk to you about how I gave up on the American dream. And you should too. But let's define our terms. What is the American dream? Well, it's having a house, 2.5 kids, a car, big screen TVs, iPhones, lots of gadgets. That's the American dream to work and to accumulate more stuff, to consume. And how do you get there? How do you get this American dream? Well, traditionally you're supposed to go to college, get a nice career, a job, work 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week at that job, get married, have children, get lots of stuff, get a house, and consume, consume, consume. And these things you're told is what's gonna make you happy. And once it was actually possible, it was possible to have the house, to have the family, for even one of the partners to stay at home and enjoy their life and still be happy. But that dream, it's no longer real. The dream that they're selling you on now doesn't exist for the average American. Now the realities are that the American dream is for you to borrow and to go into debt, to get money to pay for that college and student loans, free easy money, that until you start having to pay them back 5, 10, 20 years from now, you don't really think about. Then once you get the house, get a mortgage on that house, go further into debt, pay a higher interest rates as those interest rates are now starting to go up. Get some credit cards so you can buy some more crap, some big screen TVs, some iPhones, some Playstations, other things that, how often do you use them? Do you really need them? But you must consume, you must continue to go into debt, and then you have to work longer and longer hours. And you and your spouse both have to work. Do you ever get to see your kids? Do you get to have fun vacations? Are you happy? To me, I came to an epiphany one day that that American dream no longer exists in America. And the unfortunate part was I was actually had succeeded in the American dream. <laughs> Falling coconut, oh my goodness. So I had actually succeeded as a generation Xer in the American dream, something that's becoming rare and even rarer now. I had a nice house. I had virtually zero consumer debt. Literally, I had a credit card when I took this journey that I paid off at the end of every month. So it would have less than $1,000 on it. I would pay it off simply so I could get my rewards. So the only debt that I actually had was my mortgage on my house and my student loans. I had a good career. I had gone to one of the best law schools in the entire country. I was a good trial attorney and was making good money, but I wasn't happy looked at the things that had made me happy in my life. Things like spending time with my family, traveling, seeing new experiences, going to other cultures and learning about them, and just living life with, through new experiences. So I had all the stuff that I could want, but that stuff didn't make me happy. In fact, the stuff made me miserable because I had to protect my stuff. I had to guard my stuff. I didn't want anybody to steal my stuff. Yes, I had insurance, but you didn't want anybody to come take your stuff. And you had to work harder and harder to protect your stuff and to get more stuff. And I was never a big consumer. There were people in my family that were big consumers, but I was not a big consumer, but we still had tons and tons of stuff. And then there is the reality for most Americans who are not in the baby boomer generation. And that is that they are not happy, that they are stressed, that all they do is work and they have lots of debt and they continue to consume, trying to get that American dream that has become elusive. And I got to see in a very unique standpoint of what happens to those dreams when those folks, mostly men, reached middle age. You see, I was a divorce attorney and I got to see what happened when people had worked most of their lives to chase this American dream and when that American dream came crumbling down all around them. And there were basically two classes of people that I will talk about there. 
One was the group that had gone to college. They had taken out the student loans. They had a career. They were working 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week trying to buy more and more stuff. Their spouse, their wife was working as well. Again, more and more stuff. And their wife had gone to college. They'd done all the right things. They were in debt up to their eyeballs. And when it came time for divorce, the court could only divide their property. It could not increase their property. And what we found out with these people over and over again is that we were simply dividing up debt. It was who was going to make it to the bankruptcy court and what property and debt was going to be bankruptable and what wasn't. And there was a sad reality there because if you are a college educated person and your wife is a college educated person, that means there is a 92% chance based on the statistics in divorce that your wife is the one who's going to file for divorce against you. That's reality. That is absolutely true across America with about half of Americans, slightly less than half, that will end up divorced at least once in their lifetime. Therefore, the odds are doubly so against you if you have lived the American dream as you're supposed to and gone to college and done those things. The second group of men that I dealt with were those that had not gone to college, but had actually done some sort of trades. Many of them for whatever reason were electricians or masons, mostly electricians with a secondary of masons and then plumbers. And these guys had gone out, they had learned a trade right out of high school. They had improved that, they had gotten jobs, sometimes with utilities. And these guys, although they made less money later on in their lives as their college educated counterparts, they had virtually no debt because they had paid it all off, they had paid as they had gone, because these careers for them, although over the lifetime might not have made as much money, they didn't accumulate any debt that they had to pay off in order to get those jobs. So these guys were doing very, very well. Their houses were you know, halfway paid for. They had lots of equity in their houses after being married for that long. They didn't have, they had virtually zero credit card debt. If they had any credit card debt at all, it was again being paid off at the end of each month. And so they were in really good shape. They had pensions, they had 401ks that were actually valuable, that sometimes were worth $110,000, $120,000. These guys were, again, were in their late 30s, early to mid 40s at the time that crisis struck. But these guys faced a different problem than the college educated ones. These guys got to find out that all of the hard work that they had done for their houses, for their property, to be virtually without debt was, guess what? Now you have to give half of that to this person who no longer wants to be with you. And that's a rude wake up call, especially since they were the primary breadwinner during those periods of time. And again, 70% of divorces are filed by women in the United States. So in this case, even though they were less educated, it was generally a 7 out of 10% chance that it was their wife that had filed against them. And if they had kids, just like with the college educated ones, guess what? You get to pay child support while a court determines that really you're not as important to your children as your wife is. And unless you spend a lot of money up front on lawyers, like some people did on me, you didn't have much of a fighting chance. Those that did spend that money up front were fortunate enough to get equal custody time and it lessened that blow, but they were still ending up having to pay child support because of how stupid the guidelines are set up against you in America. So in both of those cases that I was witnessing, as in some ways a participant in it, the American dream, even if they had achieved it, was being stripped away from them and they had really very little control on how they could have set that up. But had they gone abroad, had they done other things, then they would not have been dependent upon a system that was stacked against them. So now, what it is in America is that the political system the political system is completely against you. The Democrats, the Republicans, either one, same thing. They don't care about you. They care about serving their corporate masters, making them money so they can take a little bit of slice upon the way. And we saw that this debt-driven economy where you have to continue making sure the American people are going into more and more debt and working harder and harder and harder just to keep up with the Joneses, just to try to taste that American dream, 
that eventually it is subject to a collapse. And it collapsed at least twice in the last decade. Once we had the financial crisis back in 2000, what was it, 2008, when McCain and Obama were running against each other. Then, flash forward to the pandemic and when the world shut down, we had that. In both cases, the corporations were ready with their lawyers with sheets telling their wish list where they were going to get bailouts from the government so that they could make sure that they were going to continue making money and continue to give small stimulus to the people at the lower end of the spectrum so they didn't bring out the pitchforks. The middle class, well, the middle class was who was going to have to pay for that. Those who were striving for and achieving the American dream, well, now you had to pay for everybody else's American dream. And so you didn't get the stimuluses or you'd got a reduced stimulus if you did get one in both of those situations. And the value that you had in your savings and in your investments was going to be stripped away so that corporations could get it. How did this happen? So they gave money, the government, to the corporations by taking it out of your pocket as the middle class. And then that money, the corporations, rather than using it to expand or to create new jobs, what did they do? They bought their own stock back so that they would have more control over their own companies. So none of it went back to stimulating the economy. It just went back to giving them more control of their companies so they could get higher profits and they could do what they wanted to. And then a staggering figure occurred during the late portion of the Obama, uh, in Obama administration when for the very first time in the history of the United States, the middle class was no longer a majority of the country. It had finally slipped into a minority. That is how democracies end. But what I discovered is that there is good news. There are places that you can go in this world that are far better than the United States because the United States is not what it used to be. And there are places where the cost of living is better. There are places where you do not have the stress levels that you face in the West because of the constant political crap that is going on, because of the constant working all the time, of living to work rather than working to fulfill your life, working to live. And that can be achieved, and I am achieving that. And so, <clears throat> a little over a year ago, I embarked on this journey and said I was done. I'm going. And I have never looked back, and I've never been happier. And the truth of the matter is, although I make less money now than I did when I was in the United States, I keep more money at the end of each month than I did when I was in the United States. Because my costs, my expenses, all of that are so much lower here abroad than they are in the United States. And the good news is you can do this too. The key to this is to find a skill that you can do that people are willing to pay you to do remotely. And if you can do that, and again, you don't have to make as much money as you did in the United States. You can work less hours, make less money, but have a better lifestyle than you could possibly have in the United States. The second way you can do this, or if you're really smart, you can do it while working and making a living, is to get an entrepreneurship to build some sort of online business where you can make money online. And there are tons of different ways to do this. There are the ability to teach other people a skill that you have. For instance, this doesn't apply to most people, but I'm an attorney. I can teach continuing legal education seminars on areas that I am an expert in and charge people for attending those. That is a way that I can make money remotely. You may have a skill similar to that. Maybe your hobby is something that lots of people want to do and that you can teach that. Perhaps you have a service that you can sell that can be done remotely. There are all kinds of different ways to do it, but you can bootstrap that business overseas so much cheaper while having a better lifestyle than you can in the United States. Now, one warning to you is that the powers that be are trying to stop you. President Biden and his yelling are doing everything they can to prevent you from going overseas. They've already started to try and to get other countries that have low taxes to tax you when you're abroad. During the Trump administration, Congress passed the Tax Reduction Act, which was a tax reduction act for anybody that was living in the United States, perhaps, 
or at least that's how it was sold, but it was an increase in taxes if you were an expatriate that had companies overseas. So they are doing everything they can to try to prevent you from leaving the United States, take away tax credits that you can get while you're living abroad. It's everything to keep you working in the United States and continue their cash cows on the farm. And eventually it's gonna get harder and harder to exit. So now is the time to make the plans to go abroad if you ever intend to, because they do not want you doing this. They do not want to lose their workforce. They do not want to lose their tax base. And they certainly don't want to lose their idiot voter base. Guys, if you enjoy my channel and you enjoy my work, do me a favor and subscribe so that you can actually find this channel again and you can get more content like you've seen in this video. If you found this content valuable, hit the like, let other people know by sharing this topic that this is something that was helpful to you so that other people can get this information and other people can start planning out to live their own dreams on their own terms.